think all the time and to worship you. This morning we do the same. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Century. Thanks for coming together as a church family. I have bad news for you today, and that is that your problems are big. Right? The world, our world is in trouble. Right? It's, it's dark, and, and there are a lot of issues that we're struggling with. And if you come today and it feels like the world is just kind of falling apart around you, and it's just heavy, whatever your situation, whatever's going on, either in the world that we live in or in your world right now, whatever you're feeling, it's, it's real and it's big. But I have better news for you. We have a God that is bigger than all of them. Right? He's in control of all things, and we can trust Him in that. And we've been looking at that as, uh, over the last number of weeks in this particular section of the book of Matthew, as He's been showing to us, the readers, uh, who Jesus truly is. And, and Jesus revealed Himself, kind of peeling back layer after layer among the people. Remember, it started with Him preaching the Sermon on the Mount, And when he got done, people said, who is this that's got authority like this? And then after that, he goes and begins to heal people. And people are asking the question, who is this that he has authority to speak and diseases flee? So he's a teacher. He teaches with authority. He speaks and illnesses go away. And then Jesus travels uh, to the Gerasenes. We looked at that last week. And while he's out on the water, the waves start to roar and wind starts to blow and the fishermen thought that they were going to die and Jesus wakes up from his nap and he just says, peace. Who is this? That, that just for, by speaking peace, that creation comes to a halt. Then he lands in the Gerasenes and gets kind of attacked almost by two men who are demon-possessed and, and Jesus just says, Go. And evil spirits flee. Who is this? That that he speaks with such authority and teaches in such a way that blows our minds. That speaks and illnesses flee. That speaks and creation obeys. And everything gets calm. Who speaks and evil spirits flee. Who is this? The answer we we get is in today's text. Matthew 9 as we uh, begin this chapter. Uh, This is what it says. Let's stand together if you uh, are able and let me read this for us. Getting into the boat, Jesus crossed over and came to his own city. Now, we remember last week when he drove the the demons out uh, out of the men that the crowd came out and chased him away. Like, we need you to leave our city because we don't know who you are and this is terrifying you've got incredible power and 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 we don't want you to mess up where we live so go home so jesus gets in the boat goes back to his own city which we know is capernaum just a a, a, a couple hours maybe of just floating uh, down uh, across the, the lake and behold some people brought to jesus a paralytic lying on a bed when jesus saw their faith he said to the paralytic take heart my son Your sins are forgiven. And behold, the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? What's easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk? But so that you would know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, Jesus said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And, when he, and he rose and went home, and when the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. Jesus, thank you for who you are, the life that you live, uh, the, the, the example that you set, the power that you have over our lives, uh, the sacrifice that you made. God, thank you for sending your Son. As we continue to study his life, speak to us. May your Spirit... Uh, Just show us what it is that we need to know as an individual and as a church today. What do you want from us, God? In your name, amen. You can have a seat. Just as we begin, obviously we've been studying the book of Matthew. It's written by Matthew, who was a former tax collector turned disciple. But just something to point out, next week we're introduced to Matthew. It's his calling. 
away from the tax collector table and he becomes a disciple, which is kind of messes up our heads a little bit. But what we need to understand is up until now, what Matthew has been recording, a lot of it has maybe come secondhand information from other disciples that he had been hanging out with. So his gospel is written a number of years after Jesus resurrected uh, and and Matthew is writing to uh, this the audience so they would understand who Jesus is. And so Matthew gains a lot of his information from the other disciples and from the other gospels. And so we read this exact same narrative in Mark and in Luke, but Mark and Luke were there and they uh, know a whole lot more of the details. For Matthew, there's not a lot of details. He wasn't a detail guy to, to include. But if you've grown up in the church and you've gone to Sunday school and you have read this text today, you're like, hey, there, I know that there's more to this story. And it's true. Mark and Luke expand on that. Jesus comes back to the city of Capernaum. And we remember when he left Capernaum, there was a giant crowd. Everybody was bringing the sick to him so that he could heal. And remember, Jesus says, I need to go because I have a greater mission. Not that Jesus doesn't care about sickness and illness. It's just that he cares more about people's souls. He said, I could, I could cure your illnesses and all of your diseases, but your biggest problem is the sickness of sin. And Jesus needs to take care of that. And so he goes out on mission. Well, he comes back from saving these men from demon possession, comes back to Capernaum, and the crowd is, has grown. So what we know from putting all of the Gospels together is that Jesus goes into a home in Capernaum. And if you ever get a chance, if you've been to Israel, you know that that city is uncovered and those homes are relatively small. Homes in ancient times in Jesus' day were one, two rooms uh, at best. They weren't very large. And so what you would do is, is that you would make sure then, because it's always got nice weather, you would make sure that you had a really strong flat roof on the top of your house because that was where maybe a lot of cooking would, would get done and the laundry would get done and when you had a lot of people over maybe to share in a meal together you would eat up on the roof so all that to say your roof had to be solid beams of wood covered with branches packed with mud and mortar that would turn to like concrete and you would do layer after layer after layer so that groups of people could stand on your home and nothing would go wrong so what we know about this particular narrative is that Jesus is in this house and he's teaching and the crowd was so large that nobody else could get into the house and there were a group of, of people that had a friend who was paralyzed and, and, and he needed to get to Jesus so that he could be healed. And we read that in order to get uh, him to Jesus, uh, there was no way they were getting through the crowd. So someone, we don't know, has the idea of, I guess we're going to have to go through the roof. Now, chances are really good. If this, is not, if this was the homeowner, if they own the home, they look, this is my house, everybody get out of here. My friend deserves to get up to Jesus. Probably not his house. But somebody makes a decision to go, let's go through the roof. And you can imagine the discussion that, man, I don't know. Like, that's going to be tough. We're going to be up there for hours chipping away at that thing. What are people going to think of us? There's a crowd down below. We're going to start raining, you know, mortar and concrete and branches and mud down on them. And they're going to come and, and chase us away. But as we look at these observations, I just want to give you four observations from this text today. I think what we see in the friends, but also in the man who needed to be healed, we see a revealed faith. I mean, that's what Jesus says. When, when Jesus sees him come down and laying before him, Jesus saw their faith. That there was, there was a desire that they knew if we could just get to Jesus, that there's going to be a healing and we'll do whatever it takes, however much sweat we need to put into this. And the investment was not just let's break open a hole to lower our friend up, but they knew full well because the way that the culture worked is that if you did damage to somebody's home, you better pay them back for it. They were willing to put up that cost. They are willing. We know we got to come back. For as long as it takes us to put a hole, uh, a hole in the roof, it's going to take us a whole lot longer to fill it up, but it's worth it because our friend is going to be okay. And we know, we have to assume, we're not told, but we have to assume that the faith began in this paralytic. Guys, get me to Jesus. It's not their faith that's going to heal 
him it's going to be his own he's got to put his life into the hands of his friends and trust them for all all that they're doing he can't help to put a hole in the roof he can't lower himself down but they take care of it for him and so jesus sees them come now you can imagine what that scene must have been like as jesus is teaching and people are packed in and all of a sudden you know what crumbs crumb little crumbles start to fall and bigger chunks and it's a real distraction and all of a sudden the sun breaks through and all of a sudden down comes this blanket this you know whatever it is a mat uh the friends are lowering him down talk about determination because what matters is that they believe they know we just have to get to jesus and the healing will take place 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says that we as followers of Jesus every day, we walk by faith. It's difficult for us sometimes. We, we think about faith as described as something that we have. In other words, we describe our belief system as our faith. That, that it's something that's, that's in, my, in my head and in my heart is my faith. But in reality, it's really interesting. If you go back to the Hebrew language, and you find the word faith, you will never be able to find in the Hebrew language, which in other words, in the culture of Jesus' day, faith as a noun. It's, it's not anywhere in Scripture. It's, faith is only known uh, as a verb. In other words, it's, it, it's always exposed through action. You can have a belief system, but it's when you move on it that it becomes faith. With faith, you can move mountains. So start digging, right? I mean, that, that's really what the idea is, is, is that you would be obedient to what you know by stepping out uh, in action. It says, Jesus saw their faith. He saw it through all that they had accomplished and all that they were doing. You are determined. I see that you truly believe that I could do this. This was true faith. James 2.17 says, Faith without works is dead faith. It, it's not faith. It's, it's always, what we believe is always followed up in a belief system that we move on and find action in. So whatever it is that you say, God, I know, I believe that you can do this. And it's almost like God says, yeah, I can and I will, so let's do this together. You start moving. And, and I'll work in an incredible way. I think sometimes we sit back and we say, I have faith. I just wish that God would do something about this. And God says, well, I wish you would. Right? And then you watch what I do in the middle of this. These men have faith. And so Jesus sees that and he says, take heart, child. In other words, he says, cheer up. Because there's something bigger going on here. Take heart. Your sins are forgiven. And, and we read that. And you can maybe put yourself in the position of this paralytic. And, and he's lying there going, hey, I appreciate that. But uh, we didn't go through all this effort for, for that. I, I came for a healing. But Jesus knows deeper what he needs. Your sins are forgiven. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this next point because uh, I could really get into it, but there's a, there's a religious rejection that takes place. It's heartbreaking. A man, his, his friends work hard. Uh, they lower him down to quite the scene. Jesus is teaching. Jesus turns and he says, your sins are forgiven, to which the house should have just cheered uh, for what had taken place. But instead, the religious elite, the pious, the ones that thought that they had everything figured out, who Mark tells us have traveled from all over Galilee and Judea and even Jerusalem to come and to just see Jesus. But the reason that they came wasn't to come and to worship Him. It wasn't to come and to applaud whatever He was doing. They came with only one reason, and that was criticism. We came to find out what you're doing wrong right word had spread this guy's healing people and he's calming storms and he drove out demons that these guys have had thousands of demons in them and you wouldn't believe what he's done and then it's the religious people like 
yeah, well, let's talk about what he's not doing right, though. And, and I'm telling you, the longer that, that we are around in this world, and I don't know what's happened to our culture in the last number of years, but, but I'm facing that uh, constantly, just in observation, uh, that, that we're living in this world where I don't know what it is about us as even Christians that it's turning into our first reaction to everything that, that goes on in our world is we feel like we have the right to criticize. It's, we're living in a day and age that as believers you can't even sit around and talk about, hey, let me tell you about this book that I read that really changed my life. Ooh, whoa, 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 you can't read that book, right? You don't want to toy around with that author because they don't line up with what? With my belief system. Because right? we think we have it all figured out. Now, do I think that we should be very aware of what's going on? We don't want to have a terrible theology, but, but it seems as though the culture that we're living in in the church today is that we criticize first and we give God glory second. And I see it happen all of the time. I'm even guilty of it. I've been sucked into it. I'm trying to convince myself that what I want to do is I want to be a person that gives God glory first, period. Let other people deal with criticizing. I'm not interested in it anymore. And what we have is these religious leaders that instantly they go, he's a blasphemer. How dare he say something like that? Why? Because it didn't match up with their belief system. Only God has the power to forgive sin. And, and it would almost be as though Jesus could turn to them and go, I know. Do you get it yet? Because remember, the question's been asked. How does one teach with such authority? How does one calm all of creation? How in the world can somebody have power over evil spirits? How can someone claim to forgive sins? Only God can do all of this. And that's the point. Jesus is God. And they missed it right over their heads because they were so busy looking for what was wrong rather than on what was right. As, as, as far as they were concerned, Jesus was doing everything wrong. Wait a minute, you can't, you can't heal people and declare them healed because our belief system says that it can only take place in a temple. And the only person that can, can declare that somebody's clean is a priest in that temple. And, and there was a belief system in the day that, yes, your illnesses, every one of your illnesses that you had are directly related to your sinful life. That was just a, a cultural belief. We find that in John chapter 9 as uh, the disciples bring a blind man to Jesus. And they go, we, just, we have a question. Uh, who's guilty of sin in this guy's life that he was born without vision? Him or his parents, right? So th that was... Uh, a really big belief and so only a priest could declare you clean and if you had been healed then obviously God found favor on you and so obviously God had absolved you of your sins and so but it was only the priest that could do that Jesus is one above that and he says I forgive you of your sins and so they kind of lose their mind. Isaiah 43, 25 says, I'm the Lord. I am the one that blots out your sins, and I am the one that remembers them no more. They, they know this text, these religious leaders. They just refuse to accept the fact that, that Jesus has the authority to do it. So they just say he's pretending to be God. It's the worst form of blasphemy. And Jesus turns, and I love, he, he said, why do you think such evil things in your hearts? Which should have shaken them to the core. That's when, if they didn't get it already, that, that Jesus was God and that He forgave sins, then this should have really shaken them up. Because the Psalms especially talk about it over and over again on how it is the Lord that, that knows our thoughts even when we are far off. That's Psalm 139, 2. Verse 4 says, before a word is on my tongue, the Lord knows that I'm going to say it. Psalm 94.11 says that the Lord knows every thought of every man. And so Jesus, before they can even say anything, it says they're thinking to themselves, man, this guy's a blasphemer. He's, he's 
speaking lies. And Jesus stops and he looks at them and goes, hey, why are you thinking those things? Which they should have fallen on their knees and go, but it's only the Lord. It's only God that knows our thoughts. How how does he know our thoughts? But they were so focused on looking at what was wrong in Jesus rather than what was wrong in their own hearts. So Jesus asked the question, he says, what's easier? To say the words that your sins are forgiven, which you really can't see any uh, tangible proof for it, or, or to say, get up and walk, which you then would have to see a paralytic rise and walk out the door. Which one is easier to say? Which obviously is your sins are forgiven, but Jesus says, but to prove to you, Uh, that I am the one who has authority to forgive sins, I'm going to do the more difficult thing. Rise, take up your mat, and go home. And Jesus heals this man. And in doing so, reconciles this man's soul. He starts not by healing him physically, but healing him spiritually. Your sins are, take heart. Stop being so downtrodden. Don't fear. Don't worry. Because, again, to go back, the culture of the day said, if you're sick, it's because you did something. Can you imagine this man uh, all day long just lying on his mat? Uh, The culture of the day, stories that we read throughout the Gospels show that that it was usually uh, the, the role of a family member or even friends. They would pick up uh, someone that had paralysis on their mat and they would take them maybe to the synagogue or the temple steps or somewhere into the market so that they could just lie there all day and beg that somebody would give them some, some money, some food, so that they could survive. And you can imagine the shame and the guilt in a culture that believes that, wow, this guy's in bad shape. He must have done some terrible things and he would start to believe that he's broken he can't do anything all day long to lie there and just wonder what is it that i've done all day long to get questioned what is it that you've done man to deserve that curse god and die this is no life to live we know uh, all throughout scripture that there are, first of all, there are some passages that, that put a direct link between people's illnesses uh, and their sin. David talks about it in Psalm 38. He cries out to the Lord. He says, I'm weak and I am sick and I know it's because I've been disobedient to you. I'm burdened and I'm wounded because of my foolishness, he says. And then there are other times like the blind man uh, in um, Mark chapter 9 that that Jesus says this has nothing to do with sin in his life. The reason that it's there is so that, is that I could do this, and he heals him, right? Because God is always at work. We don't know fully why particular things happen to us. We could dwell on that our entire lives. What we do know is that we just need it to be taken away, and we know that there is a God that does that. And, and David goes on to, to mention in the Psalms, he says, I'm sick, but... But on you, Lord, I will wait for my healing. I'm sorry for uh, my sin. We know, ultimately, illness, sickness, disease, death, all of it is in the world because of man's original sin. We find that out in Genesis chapter 3. That it, that it entered into the world and we all have to deal with a sick world that, that, that we get pulled into and we're a part of. And sometimes we can just admit, yeah, we can sometimes say, I can pinpoint what the problems that I have uh, to the sin that I chose uh, to passionately pursue, right? It destroys our lives. And there are other times it just happens because it's in the world. And that's just the way that this sinful world operates but we're not supposed to focus on our illnesses and our sickness and the evil and the diseases as we've seen over and over again as we've walked through these last few chapters of Matthew the focus should always be on the power of Jesus that's what matters so our sickness our illness 
our struggles, our depression, our family problems, our problems with our kids, our problems in relationships, all of that. Just like David in his sickness, he says, but I have my sickness so that I could be drawn to you, so that I could know that I need you even more. Where's your focus lie? Do you over and over again just dwell on what's wrong with you or or do you dwell on where you should on the one that makes it all right? Can you imagine this weight that this man has? Maybe even the embarrassment of, sorry about my friends, right? I, didn't, I don't want to be the center of attention, you know? Drop down through the center of this room. Jesus takes care of his soul before anything else. He just speaks peace to him. Don't worry. Don't fear. Take heart. Be joyful. Your sins are forgiven. The only thing, uh, the, the thing that only God can grant. Our spiritual needs, friends, uh, far exceed any physical need that we have. We desperately, desperately need Jesus in our lives. Second Corinthians 5.17 starts, if, if anybody is in Christ, he's a new creation. What that means is fully healed. Our souls are taken care of. The old is gone and the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to Himself through His Son, Jesus, and doesn't count our sins against us so so if you're stuck on that point today like is is what i'm going through because uh i am i'm sinful i want you to know that i can't find anywhere in uh the gospels um anywhere in the new testament that that god is just up there playing some game that that as we stub our toe and swear that the next day we get a cold right that, that, that god's not he's not this this cosmic uh, you know, like we said, kill joy, just up there constantly wanting to just watch over everybody to go, oh, you did that? Boom, you're getting this. M- measuring the magnitude of our sin to the magnitude of our illnesses and disease. You want to know why? Because that, that because of Christ who is reconciled to God. He reconciled us, not counting our sins against us. Meaning that God is not up there punishing us every time that we blow it But because we blow it, there is grace and mercy because of the cross and because of all of our sin. That weight and shame and guilt was put on Jesus on that that cross and it was finished. When we experienced illness and sickness and pain and struggle, what it does is it reminds us that we are living in a fallen world and we are fallen people and we need a Savior. And we're grateful the, the darker our days get, we are the more and more grateful for the one that has rescued us and redeemed us and has promised us a life of eternity. I hope you know that Jesus, because he is bigger than your problems. And if your problems are bigger than your God right now, then I just beg you to run to Jesus. He's big enough to carry him. He's got full authority because he is God to take care of all of it. Knowing this should leave us in the same place as the crowd that day. Jesus uh, forgives the man of his sins, relieving him of that guilt, uh, that, that weight of what have I done. Jesus says, don't worry about that. I see your faith in action. You believe in who I am. Your sins are forgiven. Now get up and go home and walk. People's minds are blown. It says that they begin to worship. They were afraid. Most translations say they marveled. That's really what it was. It was this holy fear. Who is this God? They glorified God who had given such authority to men. Now, that tells us that they didn't quite fully grasp it, the whole crowd, that Jesus was God. They just were trying to figure out who is this God that grants this kind of authority uh, to men? They still saw Jesus as a mere man, but they glorified God in it to say this is the one 
who gives his power, his authority, his seal. In ancient times, when a king would write a decree or maybe he would send a letter to another nation or, or to another uh, set of government officials to declare something, that, I need you to do this, I'm demanding that you do it, it would be sealed with wax and probably on a, with a signet ring, a ring that maybe contained uh, the name of the king or the, the crest of the family it would get pressed into that wax. And, and anytime somebody would receive that and they would see that seal, they would know that this comes directly from the one who is in the highest authority. So I know that opening this is really important because whatever it says inside, uh, we have to do. Because we need to bow to that and follow uh, that authority. Jesus, over and over and over again, as we've studied, has been sealing his authority, placing God's name on everything that he has done to prove that he himself is God. Romans 5.10 says that we're reconciled to God through Christ's death and much more. We are reconciled through his life. Matthew wants us to understand as the readers that the reason that Jesus had the power to forgive sins, to calm creation, to heal the sick, to drive out evil spirits is because Jesus is God. He has the authority because He is the authority. You get to the end of your scriptures, you get to the book of Revelation when it talks about that day that we long for, the return of Christ. And Revelation 5 tells us that it, it begins with the unsealing of the scrolls, that the seals will be broken, that will declare that it is time. And, and we are told in Revelation that there is only one who has the authority to break open the seals, and it's the one who sealed it, and it is the Lamb of God, Jesus Himself. The one who was slain for us and conquered death has the authority to open the seals to usher in a new kingdom. Do you follow Him? Do you trust Him? Do you believe in Him? That He has the power to take care of your problems because He is the power that takes care of your problems. Today, as we conclude, um, we're, I know we're throwing the, all of us as good Baptists through a loop. We only did a little bit of singing at the beginning, and we thought that with the conclusion of this text, that everybody just worshiped Jesus for who He is, that we'd take a little extra time this morning, and we would just close the service uh, in marveling who He is and worshiping Him. Let's stand together in worship. Jesus, thank you for who you are. Help us to keep our eyes on you, to stay focused on you, to know that you are the one that can take care of any problem in creation because you made creation. It's by your hands that it exists. It exists to glorify you. It does whatever it is that you said say it needs to do. May we realize and recognize that we are creation. May we submit to the authority of our great and mighty King. 